Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وبعد Dear brothers and sisters welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda uh, A quick reminder in the beginning with our phone numbers area code 0020238555 248 or 249 and the email address is tajweed at huda is ask at I'm sorry for that mistake uh, basically we have a couple of pending questions in addition to a concern from uh, one of the viewers who called last time concerning an answer to a question he heard on another program or on ask huda by another sheikh and his concern what is the right view I would like to say in the beginning that uh, when we say according to the Jumhur or according to Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i or Ahmad or Malik or Abu Hanifa, you saw different opinions in different issues of fiqh based on the available evidences. And if any of these Imams were alive and he received a sound and a profound hadith or a reference to support the other view, he would not but accept it. Imam al-Shafi'i said, my opinion is right, but it could be wrong. And my opponent's opinion is wrong, but it may be right. And the only person whose opinion is 100% true was Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and he passed away. That's also the statement of Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on him. And I repeatedly mentioned that Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, who was the greatest scholar of fiqh, always said, إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي Because we rely in answering questions on the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, the opinions of the vast majority of the scholars from the time of the Prophet wasallam through different generations and so on. So if there is a sound hadith, that outweighs one opinion versus the other, then we must resort to the sound hadith. The question was pertaining Salatul Witr, and whether is it permissible to pray it similar to Maghrib or not. Uh, the Shaykh quoted the hadith, and the hadith is a sound hadith, that it is not permissible to pray Witr in a way that resembles praying Maghrib. In what sense? to pray two rak'ahs and sit for the middle tashahud, then get up to pray the third rak'ah. This is how we pray uh, the maghrib. So the hadith says that you should not be praying which because it's a nafl similar to uh, the maghrib. And this is the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars, opposing the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa himself, who relied on hadith. In his view that one should be praying with similar to the Maghrib. And that's why the Ahnaf and those who follow the Hanafi Madhab uh, in many countries pray with this way. Have they been praying with this way based on the available opinion and their scholars taught them this way? That's fine. But when you ask a Shaykh and he says this is the opinion of the vast majority based on the sound Hadith, then we all got to remember that we're here to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As I said, if Imam al-Shafi'i or Ahmad or Imam Abu Hanifa or any of them were alive and he knew that, you know what, there is a sound hadith in this mas'ala, then uh, the mas'ala is already answered and the problem is resolved. We should not make a big deal out of it. Hanafi or Shafi'i or Maliki are not different sects, nor are as some people think different religions. No, these are different madahib in fiqh, and we discuss this repeatedly over and over and over. 
And I hope that will be the last time that a viewer would call to ask about an opinion of another sheikh in the same program. And say the sheikh said so and so. What do you think? I would rather call the same sheikh on his program since it's a live program. If you have any concern with regards to a pre-recorded program where you don't have an access to speak to the sheikh, we'll be more than happy, inshallah, to explain that. Or otherwise, it will be a great deal of waste of our time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Mushtaqa from United Arab Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you? Good, alhamdulillah. How are you, Sheikh? Great, alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Um, Sheikh, I, ha Sheikh, I had a question concerning um, uh, the term for qasri when you're traveling. Mm -hmm. How long can you join or shorten your prayers? You're talking about the distance which will make you eligible to shorten the prayer and combine them, right? No, I'm talking about the term, is in how long can you combine a prayer while traveling? The number of days, you mean? Yeah, the number of days, is it days, is it months, or how Okay, long? okay. Thank you, Mushtaq. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from the KSA, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you? Thank you for asking. Alhamdulillah, Muhammad. Go ahead. Yes, I have uh, four questions. I will try Please. to shorten them. Okay. Uh, my first question is regarding uh, my mother. So, uh, she has some gold which was given to her by her mother, mm -hmm. uh, by her parents actually. So now she intends to give the gold to her children. Mm. And uh, so now she wants to ask whether she has to pay zakah on it since the gold costs far more... Uh, Today, and then it uh, would, would have cost uh, 30 years ago. So, is it over 85 gram? Yes. Okay. Um, and now, she wants to distribute the gold on her children, right? Yes. Okay. Has she been paying the cow on it in the past? No. Okay. I will answer you, inshallah. Okay, my second question is uh, regarding video games. Mm. Uh, now there are uh, lots of video games uh, these days, uh, from some we learn something and some are just for fun, uh, like uh, you may have to, uh, there are some shooting games and some other, some uh, simulation games, so I want to ask what kind of games are permissible. Okay. And my third question is that while offering uh, Salah in Jama, now if one would do, uh, if one would do breaks, then what should one do? Uh, since people are praying behind us. So if he is the Imam and voids his wudu, or he remembers that he did not have wudu in the first place? No, no, uh, he actually had the wudu, uh, and he wasn't, he wasn't the Imam, he was just praying in Jama. So now, if, if, it, if, the, if his wudu breaks during the Salah, so what should one do? Okay. And the fourth question is that, um, everyone knows that music is haram, uh, but now music is everywhere. And if you see the news, music, there's music in that also. So now, uh, our intention is to see the, uh, to see and watch the news. Uh, so now, there's music in it. So will it be, so is it permissible then, since our intention is not to listen to the music, but to the news? Okay. Jazakallah khairan Muhammad. And we have another phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Abdul Latif from Nigeria. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I just want to have a question. Like, if you travel to another, like, you come from Nigeria to Malaysia, and you have, when you get there, your, your Axi prayer, your Mokru, your Suri prayer, will be two rakat each. For how many days? For some of color days, three days, some days, five days, and some days, seven days. Yeah, that is number one. And if I come back to Nigeria, is it going to be the same thing for the first day I came, or I'm going to continue my normal prayer? I got your question, Abdul Latif. Thank you so much. 
Another phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Wafa calling from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please, Sheikh, I have a question. Please. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to say that I don't generalize this issue. But um, almost two years ago, I noticed uh, this uh, matter that uh, some sisters who attend classes with um, some sheikh or student of knowledge or some teachers, mm. they start to express about their admiration not with um, with the topic that the sheikh or the student of knowledge. Rather, the sheikh himself. Yes, that's ah. it. That's it. Which might lead to. So the sheikh joined the celebrities club. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, that's it, Sheikh. I, 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 I want to know uh, your <coughs> advice to the sisters and to the students of knowledge who are involved in the work of Dawah. Okay. That's all. Thank you Okay, Muhammad from Egypt inquired about the difference between the fard and the wajib. We hear a lot uh, the prayer is fard. And we also hear that the prayer is a wajib. And he was wondering whether there is a difference between the two terms. Fard and the wajib literally means a must. According to the linguistic origin, the fard has a different meaning. But according to the applied meaning, fard and wajib, uh, in the sight of the vast majority of the scholars of jurisprudence of fiqh, are of an agreement that there is no difference between fard and wajib. Relying on what? Relying on a hadith when the Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, inform me about what Allah has ordained upon me. So he said five daily prayers, إِلَّا أَن تَطَوَّعَ To offer five daily prayers, unless if you want to offer, tatawa. So in this regard, the Prophet ﷺ said, the only fault is the five daily prayers. Then other than that is nafl, is voluntary, is supererogatory which means in between there is nothing. Similarly with fasting, with zakah, with hajj, the hadith is very famous. So they say, الأحكام التكليفية, the religious legislations with regards to do's and do not do's, are only five, which is fard, and uh, mandub, which is the sunnah, and then the makruh, and then the haram. So basically, al-wajib according to al-Imam Abu Hanifa and his followers or the school of Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, has a slight difference between al-wajib and al-fard based on the applied meaning. He says, for instance, al-fard is everything that has been confirmed by a certain proof. And the certain proof in their school of thought is what has been stated in the Qur'an or a sound hadith that has been narrated through a continuous testimony which is known as al-hadith al-mutawatr. So anything that has been proven via um, hadith ahad, uh, even if it is proven to be confirmed, it would not be called fard, rather they will call it wajib. Based on that, and relating to the previous question, which I answered in the very first uh, part of, the, of tonight's session, that al-wajib according to Imam Abu Hanifa, for instance, which, or what, you can call it both ways, with the fath or with the kasr, what or which, is wajib in Hanafi madhab. While according to the vast majority of the scholars, it is an emphatic sunnah, because there is no space, there is nothing intermediary between Al-Fard and Al-Nafl or Al-Mandub according to the Jumhur. It's a, the difference does not really make a, a big deal. But the opinion of Al-Jumhur is more sound in this regard, which is Al-Imam Malik wa Ahmad wa Shafi'i and the rest of the scholars of Fiqh, Fard and Wajib are alike and are the same. And based on that, Imam Wa Hanifa considers Sadaqat al-Fitr, for instance, is wajib, but it is not a fard. It has not been proven by the Quran or a hadith of the continuous testimony. That would not really uh, add much to the followers, to the uh, laymen, who just want to know whether shall I pray this as a fard or as a nafl. 
And the fard or the wajib according to the jumhur is every command that has been commanded by Allah in the Quran or in the sound sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu whereupon if the Muslim fulfills it, will be rewarded for it, and if he does not fulfill it, he will be held accountable and he will be punished for it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what we don't know. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abu Safwan from Kuwait, assalamu alaikum. Hello, sir. Hello, Mr. Sheikh Sari. How are you? Great. Alhamdulillah. Shukrullah. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question for you. This is regarding the uh, Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, R.A. Yeah. Why specifically in Hadith did you say for Sa'ad bin Ma'ad that when he was buried, the throne of Allah shook? Why not for any other, you know, Sahaba, this has happened? Okay. Uh, this has happened, but specifically for the Sa'ad bin Ma'ad. Uh, the other question, it is from my daughter, anyhow, I'm, really, I'm posing this to you. When praying in the mosque, uh, we notice that people, they change their places to pray sunnah. So what exactly is it, uh, uh, it is confirmed it is from uh, sunnah, uh, or it is, uh, is a tradition or something like it come under Bidda. So uh, Abu Rudwan, so. uh, at what time when you enter the masjid that people are praying sunnah? Yeah, that is the Salatul Masjid. But you know what, after praying, you know, this Farad, then people pray Sunnah. So when they are doing, they change their places. So is there... Oh, you, you're so, talking about changing the spot. Yes, yes, they're changing the spot, you know, for praying Sunnah or Wajib, whatever. Okay. Okay, these are the two questions. Thank you. And the third thing is, uh, about this in the, sorry, uh, I just remember, that uh, in the Tashahud, Mm. Uh, you uh, you little shake your finger, you see, uh, during the entire tashahud. So what exactly when you say Shadwalullah, Ilai Allah, Shadwalullah, Muhammad Rasulullah, it is stand still or still we can shake it? Okay. Assalamu alaikum, we have another caller. Awal from Nigeria, you are not the first caller tonight, what's going on? <laughs> I tried to shake, but... Uh, You've been trying, okay. Was, so you're not Awal tonight? Uh, not even middle. Okay, try again, Awal, please. Um, I really like to begin by answering uh, Sister Wafat's question because it has a good importance and subhanAllah, it coincides an incident. Uh, praising, admiring the Shaykh, especially by the sisters who attend certain halqas. We all have to understand that what I mentioned in the beginning, كُلُّ إِنسَانٍ يُؤْخَذُ مِنْهُ وَيُرَدُّ عَلَيْهُ Whatever the Shaykh is talking about is from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If the, the speaker is sincere and he's keen to give Hidayatul Irshad to the audience and he's trying his best to follow the same method of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ in giving da'wah, there will be a qabool and an acceptance by the audience to such person. That's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala anhu Allah used to say if you are going to follow somebody follow somebody who passed away فَإِنَّ الْحَيَّ لَا تُؤْمَنُ عَلَيْهِ فِتْنَةِ Because as long as a person is still living he never know. He may change. The hearts do change. And through my short life we've witnessed some scholars one day their peak was very high were admired by everybody. Then in a few years people dispraised them. They lost their brightness, their uh, uh, glitter, for a reason or another. So what I'm trying to do is, you actually give the answer, which is, instead I would admire the speech itself, the contents. Uh, the Sheikh was talking about the privilege of following the Prophet Sunnah, or the virtues of praying night prayer. So I talk about that, because he is copying and he is presenting what's been mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. People do exaggerate in praising people and the Prophet ﷺ forbade that and consider this a, a big sin. He said, if you see them through dust in their eyes, because that can spoil the Shaykh, as it does spoil the celebrities of uh, different fields, were not like them. The Shaykh are not like them. They are the messengers of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet, let's see how the Sahaba dealt with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and with their ulama afterward with respect, but they did not consider them in a position above the, the human ship. 
um, I noticed that there are some people who have uh, Facebook accounts in my name. I have no access to them whatsoever. And some people reported to me that there are some people who are writing words which are not proper, you know, love words, etc. Unfortunately, I have no access to such accounts. And I'm trying to contact uh, uh, the administration in order to shut them down and so on. Some of these accounts have thousands of, uh, uh, of fans or whatever. I have no access whatsoever. I do not even write a single word. My account does not even uh, proceed with the word sheikh or doctor. It's a simple without uh, a picture uh, in it. So I'm working on that. But I would like to advise everybody sometimes when uh, the, the, the viewers see a caller call and say, Sheikh, I love you for the sake of Allah. This is something which the Prophet ﷺ commanded a person. When you see somebody whom you like, whether a sheikh or a janitor, you, you like him because of his traits or manners, his religious commitment, to tell him because the Prophet ﷺ was sitting once and a man passed by. So one of those who were sitting in his company said, Ya Rasulullah, I love this man for the sake of Allah. He asked him, did you inform him? He said, no. He said, go and let him know that you love him for the sake of Allah. And he taught us how to answer by saying, Ahabaka ladi ahbabtani fi. The word in Arabic when a woman or a girl says to any person, I love you, it may be understood differently. That's why it will be best if you pray for that person, ask him to pray for you, and avoid you using or utilizing the word of love because it could be misinterpreted. Or make certain that I love to say I love you for the sake of Allah. Not just I love you. Why? Because the Nabi Wasallam was the pioneer in the field of making things very clear and avoiding the doubtful matters which may erect or cause any confusion. Do you remember when he was escorting his own wife, Sophia, and he noticed that two companions were across the street seeing him and her. And it was at night. And she was wearing a full cover, niqab. So they don't know who was she. So he stopped them saying, Ala rizlikuma, she is my wife, Sophia. So we have to be clear when we address things uh, of this nature. Jazakumullah khairan, and thank you, Sister Rafa, for presenting this question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Umm Fatima, thank you for uh, waiting for so long. Assalamu alaikum, Umm Fatima. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, we want to thank you for accepting our request to speak to us. Uh, program, Huda TV, it has been an inspiration here in Nigeria. Alhamdulillah. We are really wondering how we can have such a channel here in Nigeria. Subhanallah. <laughs> It's a very good job. Um, Sheikh, I'm wondering, I have a personal question to ask you. I don't know if I, ha if I can have a personal number I can call you. Uh, you can obtain the number from the control, inshallah, after you hang up. Okay, thank you. You're yeah, most welcome. Want to thank you and all who did TV stuff for a job. Shukran. Zakam Allah. Awal Ba is back on the line. Assalamu alaikum, Awal. Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. Inshallah. Uh, Sheikh, I have, I think, three questions for you. Okay. Uh, the first one is regarding the adage that says, uh, or oh, I should like to say, a proverb. People used to say that if Muhammad cannot go to the mountain, let the mountain go to Muhammad. Is it permissible in Islam for a Muslim to use that proverb? Uh, that's my first question. And the second one is uh, regarding teaching of birth. There are some beautiful birds that we used to love like the parrot, the, the canary, but some of, some of uh, uh, the imams in Nigeria probably said that we are denying the bird its freedom, so it is completely haram to mm. teach it. That's number two question. And uh, number three is uh, sleeping after Asr, Asr prayer. Is it haram or is it makru? Doing what That's about the Asr prayer, prayer Ewan? Yes, yeah, sleeping after Asr prayer. Is it haram sleeping? or makruh? Sleeping? Sleeping. Sleeping. Okay. Sleeping after salat. After salat al asr. Okay. Is it haram or makruh? MashaAllah. Okay. And uh, I want to remind you about my previous question regarding the pain of interest of my daddy, of my father, I should say. Uh, 
Can, can you repeat the question, please? The question was, uh, my, my, my dad, who is now late, my father, who is late, he obtained a loan in one of the commercial banks, and uh, the, the principal amount was $5 million. So, but the uh, interest accrued to $12 million. Is it advisable for me to pay together with the interest? Can you approach the pay? bank and uh, strike a deal with them that you will be willing to pay on full? only the capital sum or the original loan. If you manage to do that, that would be a win-win game. Since you said that your dad is late, you're not obliged by the Sharia to pay the interest. If there is a way, I know that for instance, in, in, in the States or in North America, when, when they lose hope of collecting the, uh, the debt, they can strike a deal with the, uh, with the debtor. So if there is a way that you can only pay the original debt, that would be great, and I would call this a win-win game. Okay? Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Uh, Muhammad from United, uh, Mahbub from United Arab Emirates asked about the tahajjud prayer. He intended to get up to pray the night prayer. Then he said, I fell asleep. Do I still receive a reward? And the hadith which is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. In that hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, if the servant of Allah intends to do a good deed, then he does it, he will receive the reward for it multiplied ten times and up. Up to seven hundred times. Up to... Allah is willing, a limited number of times. The Quran says, مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَلِهَا Whosoever does a good deed shall receive their word ten times more. That is the minimum. If he fails to do it due to an outside reason, he was planning. He was planning to perform Umrah or Hajj. He lost his money. Or he was bankrupt. He got sick. He expired. He died before that. Does he still receive the reward? Yes, when the person intended to do a good deed and he was not able to, he maintained the full reward of that good deed, including any ta'a, any righteous act. And also if the person intended to do a bad deed, if he does it, he will be punished for it as one single sin. And if he decides to abstain because recognizing that this is a disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of being punished for it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write it down for him as a full good deed. And that shows us the ultimate generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al Karim. So, Mahbub, if you intended to pray tahajjud, you set up your alarm, you want to sleep late, You've taken the means to get up to pray tahajjud and you failed. You get the same reward even though while you were asleep. Somebody was fasting and he forgot. He kept eating and drinking. Then after he finished the meal, somebody said to him, weren't you fasting? He said, oops, I was, I totally forgot. So what do we say? We say, Allah fed him and give him the drink. Resume fasting. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, إذا مرض العبد أو سافر If the servant of Allah got sick or traveled whatsoever he used to do of good and kind deeds when he was healthy and when he was resident in regular conditions will be still recorded for him. Somebody who is very usually praying uh, the sunan the nawafil before and after the prayer. He traveled and now he prays qasr He's exempt from praying the sunan. He gets the reward even though he was traveling. He is planning to fast, but since now he has to travel, سفر طاعة, uh, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this journey, he still gets and maintains the same reward. Just remember that you're dealing with Al-Ghafoor, Al-Rahim, and Al-Kareem, the most generous. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nabaji from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead. Please, I have a question. 
Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, here in Egypt, uh, in the Quran school, whenever the Mus'haf falls down, they tell you to pick it and kiss it. Please, is that permissible? Okay. Thank you, Nabaji. Omar Osman from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Brother, I have just one question. Uh, what is the ruling of uh, ruling for men on wearing orange or saffron colored garments? Wearing? Orange colored or saffron colored garments. Okay. Maybe like a t-shirt which, which is orange in color or saffron in color. Okay, I see. Is there okay. any ruling on that for men? Okay. Uh, the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ forbade wearing al-mu'asfar, it refers to the plain red, the plain red. So if a male is wearing a plain red, it is this light. Uh, there are some hadith where it has been mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ was wearing a beautiful red hulla. Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, and you can go back to the beautiful book of uh, Zad al-Ma'ad, where he discussed this in detail. He said, if the red color is interrupted with stripes or with any other color, then that does not cover such, the prohibition does not cover this. Rather, it only covers wearing plain red for men. But as far as for women, there is no prohibition. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and inshallah we'll be back in a couple of minutes, so stay tuned. In your standpoint of view, are there specific or certain criteria to choose your spouse or partner to marry or not to marry? Maybe that's the question. Do we revise? the quality of performance of our treatment between the family members as fathers or mothers. As they say usually, it's not what you say, it's how would you say it. Wouldn't you like to be a good storyteller for your kids? Neurobiologically speaking, child abuse and emotional trauma causes scars in the brain of the child and this might be not easily healing. What's the exact job description of a father? Is it closing, payments and feeding or other important things? Well. I think the job description of a father is merely giving him love and care, self-confidence, giving him sense of security, and checking for the points of strength to stress on them. What about potty training and its planning? Oh yeah, actually, it's a state, it's a condition. Fatherhood is not a body or a person, it's a state. Are you a good or skillful designer for the policy and the long-term plans of your, the life of your kids? Join us every Wednesday for family issues. and sisters, in particular brothers, husbands, divorce is the last resort. Even when I was given the topic, the art of divorce, I was thinking, why are we talking about a divorce? As they say in management, do you take serious decisions when you are angry? Mm. No one is taking a very serious decision yeah. in his life, yeah. maybe in his business, while you are angry. A divorce happened in every six minutes. We are not talking about enjoying the divorce, but we are talking about certain steps uh, to be followed in order to avoid divorce or minimize the possibility of divorce or minimize the consequences of divorce. Any divorce taking place have many ill effects. So we would like to minimize those ill effects. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, welcome back. Uh, we have Sister Anne on uh, the phone. Okay, we lost her call. Please try again, Sister Anne. 
Okay, um, a question from Mahbub as well. I would like to go to Umrah on behalf of others, family, friends. Is that acceptable? Number one, performing Umrah or Hajj on behalf of somebody who is disabled and cannot perform Umrah or Hajj, cannot travel, is permissible providing that the person who's going to do that in their state have to perform his own fard or umrah or hajj first. This is with regards to whether the person is performing the hajj of the faridah or a voluntary hajj on behalf of that disabled person. It has been narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, that a woman came to the Prophet and said that, إِنَّ فَرِيضَةَ الْحَجِّ أَدْرَكَتْ أَبِي وَهُوَ شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ that Hajj has been ordained after my father has become a senile person, cannot stand still on the back of the right. How would you travel from Medina to Mecca? So there, it's not possible. Shall I perform Hajj in his state? He said, do that. So that is the reference. And from that we learn that if the person is incapable physically uh, to perform the Hajj or Umrah, then it is permissible for others who have performed their own to do it in their state. Now with regards to the nafila, with regards to the nafila, there is a difference of opinion in this regard, whether it's permissible or not. They said, with regards to a nafila, you can only, al jumhur you can only do the hajj or umrah instead of those who passed away. But those who are living and have done their hajj or umrah once, or somebody have done it in their state, uh, you do not do it again on their behalf. As I said, this is uh, a point of difference between uh, the scholars. But wallahu a'lam, and Allah knows best. If this person is uh, disabled and cannot perform hajj and umrah, and he is eager to do it, and whether he sends somebody from his own money, or that person is going to do hajj or umrah, and finished his, and he would like to do another umrah for that person, wallahu a'lam, according to another opinion, that is permissible, and I feel very comfortable with that. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'la. But it is only a problem if you do that on behalf of somebody who is physically fat and can but does not uh, do it. Uh, Abu Jawad from Jordan asked, is the cow on stationary things such as lands, home, etc. Uh, due or obligatory? It's only due on things which are prepared for sale and you're not using. So, stationary things such as properties or lands or houses which you buy to sell, these are the catable. Once you maintain the nisab or above the nisab, the nisab is what's equivalent to the value of 85 gram of gold. This house is worth 20,000. Okay, that's way above the nisab. And... Uh, I bought it in order to sell it and generate a profit. That's my business. So you, you maintain this in your ownership while you prepared it for sale for a lunar year, then it is uh, zakatable. But if somebody is living in a house and he has another condo where he spends the summer in it and another one for his son, he built a whole building and saving it for his children when they get married, all of that is for personal use and it is not zakatable. He have a property he's saving so that when his sons will grow, they can build a building, can live together, or, or, or. That is not zakatable, or there is no zakat due on such thing. Can you give zakat to the people who are descendants of the Prophet ﷺ, of the Ali al-Bayt, the family of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ? I will answer that after I take this phone call, not to keep you so long on uh, waiting. Assalamu alaikum. My sister Anne, Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. You, and how are you and how is your family? Wonderful, alhamdulillah, shukla, couldn't be better. Good. Um, I have a question. Um, I, in my house is, um, um, let me see, the water supply for my house comes from a well, and the pump that's used on this well uses diesel fuel. And about a week or so ago, some diesel fuel got into the well water and got into the tank for my house. Mm. And so I smelled the water, and it, the smell had changed. So I, I had the kids and I made wudu in um, filtered water from the 
from the ki- the kitchen sink. Mm. And so I was wondering how do I need to clean that tank out, or as long as I don't smell it when I'm you know when the water's coming out, as long as that like you know the smell just kept getting lighter and lighter, and now it's I don't think it's there. So now is it safe then to make wudu from that water, or okay. do I need to clean the tank? And then um, my second question is in Surat Al Baqarah, the page where. Um, uh, Allah is talking with um, the angels uh, regarding the creation of Adam, and Iblis is there, and he asks Iblis to bow, and Iblis refuses. So I understood from this page that Iblis and Adam are in the presence of Allah, and they see him, so there's no doubt in his existence, correct? And then it says down below um, that um, Allah called him, you know, asked him to, to bow down. He didn't, and he said he was Abba was Sikadara. And I understood that the word kafir means that he covered up. So what was he covering up? And does this mean that you can see Allah, believe in him, and still be a kafir? Thank you. Okay, because your second question is very lengthy, I would like to tackle it immediately. As far as your first question, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. I bet you it's very, very hectic. If you do not find the smell anymore, or occasionally, then the water is pure and you can use it. Uh, for wudu, uh, obviously. Uh, the second question, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, to, uh, said about Satan that he abba, was takbara, wa kana min al kafirin, he refused, and he was arrogant, and according to that, he became one of the disbelievers. The literal meaning of the word kafara is to conceal, or to hide up. And that's why one of the names of the, for, the farmers or the action that the farmer does by sowing the seed under the ground and covering it up is kafara. يُعْجِبُ الْكُفَّارَ لِيَغِيظَ بِهِ يُعْجِبُ الزُّرَاعَ لِيَغِيظَ بِهِ الْكُفَّارَ So the word kafara literally means to cover up or to conceal. But it does not really mean here that he covered up. Uh, rather, وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ Yet he became one of the disbelievers who cover up the truth, who refuse it, who deny it, who conceal it. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Muhammad from the KSA, several questions. But before that, we had a question from uh, Machan from United Arab Emirates about shortening the prayers. And that was repeated at least a couple of times during this episode. Uh, the period, for how long? According to the Jumhur, if the person intends to stay in one place more than four, for more than four days, eliminating the day of the arrival and the departure day, then the person is due to pray on fall, even if he or she is staying in a hotel. But if he's always on the run, or if the person has not determined how long is he staying, so every day says, I may leave tomorrow, or in two days, even if he ends up staying for a month, but he is not certain when is he leaving he is still eligible to shorten the prayer and combine it uh, as well um, Muhammad from the KSA his mother has mashallah plenty of gold and she intended to distribute it upon her children he's asking about the zakah I asked him whether the gold reaches the nisab which is the 85 gram of gold he said it exceeds that why exceeds that when that gold is divided before the due date of the zakah, then she owes nothing of the zakah. Rather, it will be the responsibility of the recipients. If they maintain it for a lunar year, and meanwhile, each division by itself or along with other positions with the new recipient reaches the nisab, which is a value of 85 grams of gold. According to Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, a woman or a man who have gold with the intention of uh, wearing it for uh, jewelry, adornment, the person must pay zakah on that. Due to many a hadith, one hadith, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wa ardaha once entered upon the Prophet sallallahu and she was wearing a few rings. He asked her, what is this? Fatahat, silver rings. He said, what are these? She said, I made them to adorn myself for you, Ya Rasulullah. I said, do you pay the zakah on that? She said, no. 
he said it would be sufficient for you as a mean of punishment uh, in Al-Fahr Wal-Aidu Billah if you do not pay the zakah on that. The scholars differ with regards to what is the meaning of paying zakah on that. Is it to lend it to neighbors, to give it to those who uh, need it for some time, or to pay the actual zakah? So the summary is, according to the Hanafi madhab, uh, women must pay zakah on their jewelry if they possess what's equivalent to the nasab or more by itself or along with other positions. And I mentioned repeatedly that this is what I feel comfortable with. Al-Jumhur, Malik, and Shafi'i, Ahmad are of the view that the jewelry which women wear for adornment are exempt from uh, the zakah. Video games. Which is halal and which is haram, and he specified shooting games and all of that. Uh, it depends on the contents. Video games, along with music and nude pictures and all of that, definitely this is haram. But uh, volleyball, uh, shooting games, stimulation with no awful words, shooting is good. Uh, in order to learn how to aim in order to excel in, in, in martial arts for everybody. This is not uh, terrorist activities. These are things that everybody must be, uh, must be prepared for it, learn how to play things of this nature. It's available everywhere in any country. So it's also the right of uh, the Muslim youth if they do not have any other viol violations of the Sharia. Ah, yes, it is permissible. There are some awful violent games which will turn the person according to the psychologists and psychiatrists into a violent person, that we have to put a stop to that and avoid that. Um, he was praying in jama'ah, ah, or somebody is praying in jama'ah ah and lost his wudu. How to behave about that? Any person, whether an imam or a ma'mum, a follower, praying in congregation or praying in jama'ah, ah, while praying, remembers that he does not have wudu or voids his wudu while praying, must not continue any single part of the prayer afterward. Because a prerequisite for the validity of the prayer, at tahara. If you're not in the state of tahara, then it is haram to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pretend that you're praying uh, because you are ashamed that people would think that you void your wudu. Even if you are the imam, you just step out and you go to make wudu and come to join the prayer again. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, watching the news which contain music, musical effects and so on. There are uh, other news without the music. And if you want to read the news, watch the news and once you hear this, you lower the sound or whatever, that of course would be best. And in this case, it is permissible. The problem is with those who listen attentively or enjoy listening to that music. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'la. Abdul Latif from Nigeria, I guess your question was answered pertaining Qasr al-Salah, traveling from Nigeria to Malaysia. I don't have to repeat uh, the answer. Uh, <clears throat> Abu Ridwan or Abu Safwan from Kuwait asked about the great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sa'd ibn Mu'az, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about a great virtue that happened to him of ihtizazu arsh al-Rahmani lahu, etc. Many companions because of their uh, high ranking in the deen, their great support to the da'wah, have exclusive features, exclusive virtues. Hanzalah, ghasil al-malaika. No one was washed, his body was washed by the angels like Hanzala. Um, others, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Julaybib, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam carried him by his own hands and he buried him and he prayed for him. Uh, Al Hamza, may Allah be pleased with him, Amun Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyid al Shuhada. So everyone, according to their activities in the deen, and their hard work and their very special relationship between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were given some honor. Um, he also asked about changing the position in the salah. You see some people after praying for the intent to get up and move to another place in order to pray the sunnah. Is this a sunnah? It is not required, but if the person does that in order to 
have his sujood spot changed because every spot where you put your head, forehead on it will bear witness for you on the day of judgment that you prostrated yourself for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it is permissible. Moving the finger in the tashahud, I discuss this in details. The details is prolonged in the program of the Prophet's prayer. But it is the sunnah and I discuss the difference between the different madhahib whether to keep it uh, pointing or to move it or to only move it when you say the tashahud or when you make the dua such as Allahumma salli ala Muhammad move it up and word, uh, up and down, right or left and so on all of that is discussed in the program of the Prophet's uh, prayer uh, unfortunately we ran out of time and I was told that we have to wrap it up so brothers and sisters until next time I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept this humble effort from all of us to pardon us and forgive us our sins. أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Help me.